reflection on scriptures for the coming uh, Sunday. Uh, this week is Pentecost Sunday, and it's the last uh, day, technically, of the Easter season. It's the 50th day. Uh, Pentecost, of course, uh, was a Jewish feast, which uh, was uh, known to uh, known as the Jewish Feast of Weeks, uh, and is still observed in the Jewish tradition even to this day. It was the completion of seven weeks, and it was the end of the spring harvest. So many of the feasts that Jesus celebrated in his time would have also been agricultural feasts. The readings uh, for this coming Sunday are opening from Acts, the second chapter of Acts, uh, a section from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians in chapter 12 where he encourages us that we are all members of the family of Jesus. And the uh, gospel comes again from John's gospel from the 20th uh, chapter. And it is the same gospel reading that we heard on the uh, Easter Sunday. Namely, where Jesus is pictured as coming to the disciples gathered in the upper room, uh, hiding out for fear of the authorities. And <clears throat> Jesus is pictured in the gospel <clears throat> as wishing peace to his disciples and then breathing on them and receiving, he says, the Holy Spirit. Whose sins you forgive are forgiven, and whose sins you retain are retained. This is John's version of the Feast of uh, Pentecost or the Holy Spirit that we observe this coming week. Well, <clears throat> as I mentioned last time, we, throughout this season, first reading, have been looking at the book of Acts of the Apostles. And I'd like to, uh, today to finish up or look at some aspects of this very most important book. In fact, we would not be celebrating the Feast of Pentecost if it were not for the book of the Acts of the Apostles. Because in this work, the writer Luke, as we mentioned before, writes a dual work, namely a gospel and then this account of the early church, <clears throat> mentions that it was on the advice of Jesus as he had ascended into heaven. And again, it's only in Luke's story that mention of Jesus' ascension takes place. But that Jesus' words, you remember, had been to the disciples, go to Jerusalem and wait there for the coming of the Spirit. And that's how the book of Acts begins, with the disciples and a group numbering 120 persons, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, <clears throat> gathered in a room. Many <clears throat> suggest that that room was the same room as Jesus had uh, celebrated the supper with. That's a history that's a uh, a, a kind of story that emerges. And <clears throat> as they are in that upper room, uh, Peter had decided that the number 12, which had been decimated by the loss of Judas, be fulfilled. And you remember that a man named Matthias had been chosen to take the place. So now everything is ready in the upper room. It's important to notice, uh, as I suggested a number of times, that the writer, who is very c careful of following what's known as the Hellenic style, also is well versed in the tradition of Judaism. And so as they are gathered there in the upper room on this day, as chapter 2 begins, there is a powerful wind and a mighty flame of tongues of fire which come and settle over the heads of all who are <clears throat> gathered in that room. And this, of course, is the Pentecost event. But listening very carefully, one notices symbols that are very important in the Hebrew Bible or in our Old Testament. For the presence of fire <clears throat> always indicated the coming of God upon a person or a group in a very special way. Remember Moses, long ago, had been attracted by a bush that burned without consuming. 
and he had been so attracted to it that he had come up into the presence of God and been commissioned. There, <clears throat> and wind is always a powerful image in the scripture. The wind of God, the breath of God. Uh, some of the great uh, prophets, like Elijah, had experienced the presence of God in a powerful wind that came uh, upon them. So this opening story is grounded in Old Testament background. Now if one listens, what happens is, after this, uh, there, and there's noise, of course, and any good, there's only almost a kind of visualness to it, right? Noise, wind, fire, all of the things that appeal in a certain way to the senses. Well, once this is done, Peter now gets up and he will give a speech because apparently this noise had attracted many others in uh, Jerusalem and they had gathered around the place where the disciples were. And it is here that Peter gives his first talk. Remember I said that throughout this work called the Acts, there are many speeches, some 24 different speeches given. Uh, this is the first and it is given to a group of people and Luke is careful to tell us that there were people from, and there are names, I'm sure, when you hear them, that you say, where did they come from, and who are they? Parthians, Medes, Almanites, Mesopotamians, Cappadocians, Judeans, Pontians, Asians, Phrygians, Pamphylians, Egyptians, and people who come from the territory of Cyrene. And you say, well, I'm good at geography. I would know where those were. And you would be correct if you noticed that those were places really surrounding Jerusalem in a certain way, uh, forming a great circle. And all of those who were present at this occasion were Judeans. They lived in these different parts of, uh, of the Mediterranean world what was known as the diaspora for the Jews. They were all Jews. And why exactly they were gathered? Now, maybe it was because it was the Feast of Pentecost that they had come up to Jerusalem. Or were there some who were inhabitants of Jerusalem, who simply had come from that background and lived there? Now, those of you who listened carefully noticed that of all those names, there were 12. Always Luke is very cautious to make sure that the 12, which is the complete number, were present for this opening talk. Some were travelers, most of them were Jews, and um, here they were, now gathered by this noise. And Peter are, now gives his opening talk. Now you can go and read it, it's not included in the readings for this Sunday, but you can read through chapter 2 and you will see that it is all about the fact that Jesus had long been promised, now came, that he had been crucified and raised, and that he was indeed the true Messiah, the true Savior. So successful is Peter's opening address that 3,000 were baptized that day. Now, I've often cautioned, be a little careful about numbers. Can you imagine 3,000 people? That would have been more people than inhabited Jerusalem on any given time, even with a festival. But you, you're captured, 3,000, wow, he really was successful and that, that they were baptized, well, it's a lot of work, however they did that. But the opening of the uh, church, and sometimes this is called the birthday of the church, was done in a magnificent way. Great representation from all over the world, um, powerful speech on the part of Peter, and the repentance and acceptance of Jesus took place. So that is what we celebrate uh, as the opening story on uh, Pentecost Sunday. I'd like, however, to continue now the story of the book of Acts. Remember, we got to chapter 15, the middle of the, uh, the book, which really kind of marks the end of Peter's work in developing, at least remembered 
uh, tradition of the early church. And that Peter, remember, had been invited by a Roman centurion named Cornelius to come to his house and tell him about this message of the risen Jesus. And in fact, so successful had Peter been that Cornelius and his household had been converted. Now, Peter has to go back to Jerusalem to report what he has done, because this is now a, a break in the way things had been done. Up to this point, point, only those who were of the Hebrew background seem to have accepted Jesus. Now you have what the Jews would call Gentiles, what we would call the others, uh, had been willing to accept and in fact to remember as Peter had welcomed Cornelius into uh, the fold, there had been a second coming of the Spirit upon that household. So the coming of the Spirit, not quite as dramatically as in chapter 2, but nevertheless a real presence of the Holy Spirit upon those who accepted the message of Jesus. So you can see in the Acts we are getting a wonderful story of how the development of our Christian Christian family uh, takes place. Not everyone were, hap were happy about what had happened. And we ended last time by having the uh, proponents of different viewpoints come up to Jerusalem. This is found in chapter 15, which sort of centers the work of, uh, of Acts. And it was there that the viewpoints were uh, presented. The writer Acts of Acts uses the phrase, no little discussion. Now, isn't that a nice way to say they argued a lot, okay? So next time you have an argument, say, we have no little discussion about this point. See how that works. Anyway, uh, the representation of the traditional way seemed to have been done by James, who was the head of the church in Jerusalem. That may surprise us because we always think Peter was immediately the head. Not so. Peter was more a floater, which therefore made him a missionary and put him in the same category as Paul would be. And that's interesting why uh, and their, both their roles followed that of Jesus, namely being a prophet, someone, as we mentioned last time, who speaks for God, who in this case speaks on behalf of Jesus. And uh, so James is a little unsure whether this is the way it should happen. Paul says, of course, no, no problem. Let them become Christian, but don't make them necessarily being Jews. And it is in his concluding role here, Peter, who kind of says, look, let's see if we can't find a compromise. And that's the way in which Luke presents the story. In Luke's accounts, people always find a way of coming to agreement. If only Luke's way were always our way. Uh, if you want, there are two versions of this uh, council, as it were. Another one is found in a letter written by Paul to the Galatians. And in that letter, he says, I went up to Jerusalem, and I told them that this is what I was doing, and I told them that it was the right way to do it, and they agreed. So from Paul's point of view, uh, there was no uh, counsel or discussion here. It was his reporting that he was doing it, and he had no intention not to continue this way. So if you want to get these words, go to the third and uh, fourth chapters of the letter to the Galatians. So from this point on, the emphasis now in Acts shifts to the mission of Paul. Not that Peter um, gets one more role and uh, it's not one he would like. Apparently, uh, just as an aside, uh, Peter, who liked to go to Antioch, Antioch would become, as I men mentioned before, Antioch of Syria would become the new center of the uh, Christian experience, particularly because Jerusalem of course was destroyed in 70 and therefore you needed a new center of the church. Well, when Peter came down to uh, Antioch on one occasion, he started to eat only with Jews who were Christians and not as 
uh, with Gentiles as he had been accustomed to do. And Paul says, Pete, you're wrong, and stop doing that. So sometimes, I don't those who want the Peter-Paul relationship uh, look again and read how it happens. All right. So from this point on now, we hear of the work of Paul. The story begins earlier when Paul had been presented as a persecutor of those who accepted the Jesus way. He thought this was an aberration. He was at this point not wanting any changes. Do you know people like that who do not want any changes? And so Paul was there. So much so was he opposed to change that you remember when the martyrdom of Stephen takes place, Paul was a witness to that. But shortly after that, as Paul is now deciding that he will go to Damascus. Now, why was Damascus important? Because at this point in time, the whole province was known as the province of Palestine. It included Palestine itself, but also today what we would know as Syria, Lebanon, and Jordan were all part of the, this Roman province, and the capital there was Damascus. So that's why Paul, and that's why Luke has him go there, because in, it's not simply a Jewish city, but it's becoming more and more a Gentile center. And so as Paul is on the road to Damascus, a story that everyone is uh, familiar with, he encounters in a dramatic way the risen Jesus. Now, by the way, this story of the Damascus road is told, as you might guess, to make a good point, three times. Remember I said that uh, teachers like to use three, and Luke, of course, is a good teacher in this regard. So it's told here in on his road to, to Damascus um, <clears throat> uh, the first time, but it's told later on if you read uh, in chapter 22 and in chapter 26. We'll come back to this a little bit as we go along. As he is going along, he is struck by a bright light and um, thrown to the ground and um, hears a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Jesus, uh, Paul responds, well, who am I persecuting? And the answer is Jesus. Now, had he been persecuting Jesus personally? No, but he had been persecuting those who believed in Jesus. So you notice right from the beginning, there is a community aspect to the story of Paul. Paul is always connected with a group or with a, what we would call today probably, a small church. Paul gets up, he is blinded, he is led by those with him to the city of uh, Damascus, where he meets a leader there named Ananias, who had also been told that Paul was coming, and he had said to the Lord, you know, this guy, this guy is dangerous. You don't want to, we, maybe we don't want him. And the voice had said, I have chosen him to be my messenger. And although sometimes this road to Damascus is talked about as the conversion of Paul, and there may be a truth to that, it is perhaps better understood as the call of Paul to be for Jesus the messenger, messenger of the kingdom. Um, by the way, almost every painting you may have seen of Paul on the road to Damascus shows a horse. Now, whether there was a horse, we don't know. But that he was tossed off his horse is not in the text. So on your Jeopardy question, uh, be very uh, careful to point that out, that Paul was fell down to the ground with a blinding light, but not necessarily thrown off a horse. But artists, perhaps I think Cavallaro, are very much like this, and uh, those that's the picture that uh, you have. Now... The story of Paul, as the great spokesman of, uh, of the Christian message, 
finds Paul preparing. He goes into the wilderness, wherever that is, for uh, called Arabia in that time, but it's not Saudi Arabia. It's anything the other side of the Jordan was considered Arabia in those days. Um, and prepares. Now, interestingly, we have stories of Jesus and Peter preparing before their ministry. So although he is called, he now prepares, and then he comes back to Damascus, begins to teach uh, about the risen Jesus, makes some converts there. Now notice this is important in a way. It's the center of the whole big province, and it is he who is now successful in bringing the message of Jesus to the community there. So angry do some people get there that Paul has to escape from the city of Damascus by being lowered in a basket over the city wall. Now, I, we mention that because it's one of the few things that Acts agrees with in a letter that Paul wrote, again, the Galatian letter, where he describes this as uh, taking place. So Paul's message, and always kind of keep in mind that this is Luke's story of Paul. There are two accounts of the life of Paul. One is the one we're looking at here in Acts, and this again was written well after the time of Paul, when we believe, you remember, that he had been executed under the persecutions of Nero sometime in the mid-60s. The usual date is anywhere from 64 to 67, along with Peter. Again, Peter and Paul, both martyred in Rome, would make that the center of the new church in many ways. And that's important to notice uh, where we are going with this story. Now, one of the characteristics of the Acts of the Apostles is that the, by the time that the Acts has entered, entered, the message of Jesus has been brought to the ends of the earth. Now, this is a kind of tricky little way that the writer of Acts does this. We have to back up a moment to remember that there was <clears throat> one of those seven that had been chosen earlier on named Philip. And Philip uh, had brought the message of Jesus to Samaria. And then as he <clears throat> was pictured as going back to his home country, he was the eunuch of Ethiopia. Uh, or the, He wasn't, but that was the guy who was leaving the city. And Philip is portrayed as catching up to the eunuch as he's going back to Ethiopia. Now, how <laughs> Philip could have been running next side to a chair, uh, chariot that was carrying the eunuch, I'm not quite sure. But anyway, it's a good story. And at a certain point, Phil overhears the eunuch reading something, and he says to him, do you know what this means? And the guy says, well, no, how am I supposed to know what it means? And so, so somebody interprets it. And Phil says, I'm your man. And he climbs in, and it's, of course, a reading from Isaiah. Do we ever not get Isaiah in the story? And explains all about Jesus, who he was, what he did, what his message was. And the eunuch says, can I be baptized? And they come to a river, and the two of them climb out. Phil baptizes the eunuch. The eunuch continues his journey to Ethiopia. Now, what's so important about Ethiopia is that at this point in the story that was being told historically, Ethiopia represented the ends of the earth in the eastern direction. So when the eunuch returns, and he's an important person in the court of the Ethiopian queen, brings the message of Jesus there, he has kind of done what Luke hoped for. The message has gone to the ends of the earth in that direction. All right, so that's why Phil becomes kind of an important uh, person. All the characters that uh, Luke just makes heroes uh, have important roles in the ultimate story of the Christian faith. Now we're back to Paul. Paul is now pictured along with his fellow uh, 
preacher Barnabas, and Barnabas had been the one who had pointed out that maybe Paul wasn't such a bad person after all, once he was converted, became a worker. And as they are gathered at Antioch on one occasion, uh, <clears throat> there are five men come together, and the community at Antioch decides that they need to share the message of Jesus with others. And so they bring these together and they deputize, I can use that word, Barnabas and Paul to bring the message of Jesus now to the West. They're going to get into an into a boat. They will uh, sail to Cyprus. I think I mentioned that before. Uh, that was the homeland, of course, of Barnabas. Uh, he will become later on the patron of, Bar of the uh, of, uh, of that place and is still to this day considered to be the patron saint. Now, uh, to simplify this as much as we can, what Luke does, and of course it goes back to a point I made last time about the theme of journey, how much people are always traveling in uh, Luke's story. Even the Damascus story is a travel from Jerusalem to Damascus, and of course it's along that way that Paul uh, is uh, called or converted, however you would like that to be. Now he will begin to show how the message of Jesus spreads. And although it's not perfect to notice how this works, he pictures Paul as going on three missionary journeys. And each of these journeys seems to get a little bit further, not perfectly, but <clears throat> Uh, you know, like uh, semicircles, and uh, spreads and spreads and spreads, uh, so that finally, it, at at a certain point, where Paul has been pretty interested in uh, in staying within Asia Minor, is now pictured as called to um, share the message. Uh, in the West. All right, so you can study this and notice the missionary journeys of Paul and how successful he is. As the story of Acts winds up, Paul now is going to make one last journey, not one of these three, but one last journey to, of all places, Rome. <clears throat> and he goes back to Jerusalem. And he has a lot of trouble in Jerusalem. And you can read all about this. In chapter 22, he has to tell his story of the conversion. <clears throat> and the authorities are not sure what to do with him. The, the Roman authorities actually step in and save Paul uh, on a couple of occasions. And Paul then makes an interesting statement. Wait a minute, before you do me any harm, remember I am a Roman and I have a right to a trial in Rome. <clears throat> well, the Roman leader, Festus, says, well, let, we'll do that. Uh, he has another <clears throat> episode where he has to present his case, and you will find this in chapter 26. So the same story of the Damascus Road, but never, the, if you want something to do for homework, line the three up and notice it, the differences. There are little subtle differences in the way in which the story is, is told. Anyway, at the end of uh, this uh, chapter 26, uh, <laughs> The three Roman persons, this took place at a place called Caesarea Maritina, which as we mentioned was on the sea coast. Uh, if this fellow had not made the claim, I want to be sent to Rome, we would have let him go. He's not guilty of anything. Well, <clears throat> of course, for Luke, it's important to get people, or Paul rather, to Rome. So he takes a long journey. That's the last part of the book of Acts, last five chapters. Chapters. Uh, there are all kinds of adventures. He gets shipwrecked. Um, he saves people. He helps people. But finally, in the last chapter of Acts, he comes to 
Three Taverns. Now, Three Taverns was not a drinking place, by the way. It was the name of a community just outside of the city of Rome. And there, the Jewish community, some of the Jewish Christians come to meet him. And the book of Acts ends really, in a, for many, unsatisfactory way. Paul is pictured as being there teaching, and that's how the book of of, of Acts ends. Now, there are all kinds of suppositions, but some say that Paul went on to teach it, uh, to bring the message to Spain, which may have been true, but we have no real evidence of that. But what is important is that Paul has now successfully brought the message of Jesus to Rome, the new center of the Christian church. If it before it had been Jerusalem, if it had been at Antioch, it now is where, appropriately, for good stories to end, in the capital city. And from there, the message of Jesus will now spread um, throughout the world. So in that sense, it looks as if Luke has uh, purposely let Paul be teaching in order to say, that the message doesn't end. It simply begins anew. The book of Acts is not the conclusion of the story of Christianity, but is simply another opening or beginning. If the gospel pictures Jesus as inaugurating the kingdom of God, Peter and Paul in the Acts inaugurate the kingdom of God as the prophetic speakers of God's word but it continues and moves on uh, to our day. There are many other uh, interesting aspects of Christian life that are found in the Acts of the Apostles. If you have the time, um, you know, because we will not be coming back to Acts uh, again, at least uh, on Sunday worship, uh, during, um, do read it. There are some fascinating stories. Uh, many fill in aspects of Paul's life by the way that we would not have known of, but uh, also there are differences of viewpoint. But I think always to keep in mind in uh, Luke's perception of things that Christians can find a way to get along, but differences will continue. And what's important is to listen to the differences that uh, that are articulated. Again, um, Paul gives, I'm never quite sure whether Paul's speeches are longer than Peter's, but I do have a sneaking suspicion that they are. For in some ways, it would look that the author of Acts leans toward Paul a little bit more than Pete. Uh, why? Well, maybe because the author himself although very familiar with Judaism and its customs and practices, may himself have been a convert of uh, Paul's teaching. And there is a theory, as you know, that uh, for one of the journeys of Paul, uh, Luke was his traveling mate. Now that, if you read the second uh, journey, and you can kind of notice the picture there, um, <clears throat> speaks, is known as the we section. And everyone wants to know, who is the we? Well, if it's the author, Pete, or Paul, and I, there's the we. That's a theory. There are a lot of interesting theories that are connected with the, uh, the story of Acts. I hope this has been a little bit uh, helpful in appreciating what certainly is a major contribution to the story of Christianity and to the development of our faith. If you think of it, many of the customs and practices that are part of our liturgy and are part of our church rest in the story and information that's connected in the Acts of the Apostles. So we're grateful for this work that the whoever the writer, we call him Luke, uh, contributes to our story and to our faith. Thank you very much for uh, being with us, and uh, we hope that this has been helpful.